good to see everybody here tonight. Thank you so much for being a part of this this evening. And I don't know if I should be really short or be really long because it seems like it doesn't matter because the storm is going to hit us regardless. So hopefully it will be encouraging, let's put it that way. So I thank you so much for having this opportunity tonight. I hope the things that I say to you will be encouraging and edifying to you. And as always, I thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, I asked Tracy on the way up, I said, do you enjoy it as much as me when I come up here? She goes, well, not as much as you, but that's because she has to drive. <laughs> so, but I do appreciate it, and she does too. And, and um, you know, funny thing, I've been joking around, uh, some of you know this, uh, I've been telling everybody I've been tailgating after Wellsburg, after service at Wellsburg, because uh, we had an opportunity uh, after church just to uh, stand around and goof off and we had food we was going to eat on the way home but we gave it to some people and and uh, I just dragged the, my uh, yard chair out and Trace's like, what are you doing that for? We're not going to be here that long. I said, you sure about that? <laughs> so it was just great. It's always great to be here. So I thank you so much for letting me be here. Um, tonight we're going to talk about striving lawfully. Uh, as Mr. Cohen read there, in 2 Timothy, we see Paul is giving instruction to Timothy because Paul's not going to be here much longer. We understand that through history. We understand that through scriptures. He recognizes this, and he's trying to give instruction to Timothy what he needs to do when he is no longer there. And sometimes I ask myself when it comes to the epistles like Timothy and Titus, is that really just set for evangelism itself, or is that set for you and I? And if it is the latter, I think we need to think about some of the things that is being told here uh, to, to uh, Timothy that is a concern, um, not only to the Apostle Paul, but it should be a concern for you and I. Just ask yourself this when it comes to spreading the gospel. Can he stand up to the pressure? Can you stand up to the pressure? Could you handle all the problems and circumstances that would arise? Would you work hard enough? Would you study hard enough? Would you learn hard enough? Would you pray hard enough? Would you witness enough? Would you preach enough? Will you teach enough? Will you endure enough? Would you strive enough? And would you war enough in the spirit? This passage specifically reminds us that the things that we need to do, not just do them, but do them lawfully. And not just do them lawfully, but strive to do them lawfully. There has to be attitude, there has to be initiative, there has to be desire to do these things. And that's why Paul's not just telling him to take the walk, he wants him to take the run. And you and I should have that same desire as well, is not to take the walk, but to take the run. Go full bore, go, uh, go gas open or, or to pedal to the metal, whatever uh, euthanism you want to take, do it with all the initiative of all your strength and all your might. And, and what I want to talk about here tonight is maybe some of the issues that we see that we need to continue to strive lawfully against. And the first one we need to talk about here tonight is strive lawfully against laziness. If you look there as a Hebrew writer tells us uh, in Hebrews chapter 13 starting in verse 14, it says, for here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is set to come. And through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of the lips that acknowledge his name. And do not neglect a gift to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing, are pleasing to God. And, and what I want us to understand here is there is false doctrine spread around everywhere. Not just today, but even back to the times of the Hebrew writer, we see that false doctrine is being spread. Sometimes it's spreading so bad, people get carried away by it. Sometimes it's so bad that it emphasizes tradition over the word. Sometimes it's so bad... We don't realize it's not profitable to follow these false doctrines. And sometimes we don't realize that it's not involving the right sacrifice. And therefore, because we see this false doctrine out there, we must understand that we need to do an awful stance again against it. And do it, striving to do it, striving to lawfully do it. My son Peyton, he makes me mad every time I talk to him anymore. And, and, and the reason being is because he comes up to me, uh, he says, Dad, somebody asked me to 
go preach at a certain place. And I was like, you suck. Uh, just, <laughs> and the reason being is because I don't think he realizes how easy it is for him now compared to my time. And what I mean by is this. When I was a younger preacher, it was hard for me to go anywhere and preach the gospel. And it wasn't for a lack of trying. It was just there was a lot of go- other guys that were doing it. And in my area, <clears throat> there was all kinds of guys going from place to place, going from church to church, preaching the gospel. And I wasn't fortunate to have that opportunity. So what did I do? <laughs> like I do now, I drive a couple hours away and go preach somewhere else. And, and, it's, and that's where I got my opportunities to learn. Him, that little jerk, he gets to do it in his own backyard. And that's the thing that kind of frustrates me about this because he doesn't know about traveling as much as I do or, or his mom traveling as much as, as we have. But, but what I want us to get at here is how unfortunate it is that our preachers are getting smaller and smaller by the number. And how when we have somebody in Peyton's youth, we're begging him to stay. And we're doing everything we can for him to keep evangelizing. There's quite a few congregations out there that are still looking for a preacher. There's a couple congregations out there that took him forever to get a preacher. And maybe that he's not the ideal preacher, but it's not like they can pick the cream of the crop to who they can have there either. Those are the problems. And it's fortunate that you don't necessarily have that situation because you have a lot of individuals that is willing to step up and do these things. But may I encourage those that even step up and do those things, let's strive lawfully to do these things to encourage and edify one another. I want us to be individuals when somebody comes up in this pulpit, no matter if you have them come in from another state or you have them come six rows up here, the individual is up here to, pl- to give, him, give you all he's got when it comes to the gospel. He needs to bring it. I, I say that often. He needs to bring it to you to be encouraging, to be edifying. If I'm not doing that, you better tell me I'm not doing that because I need to be doing that. And you need to tell the other guys up here if they're not doing that, that they need to be doing that. Because that is your soul that's being dependent on here. And that's my soul being dependent on here as well. That's important. And and just keep in mind, just like these individuals are dealing with this false doctrine, we are all dealing with the same thing. Tell me real quick, anybody, I don't care who it is, tell me one thing that you feel like you're fighting in this area. Okay, spiritually. (laughs) That's a good point. It is. It's true, Chuck, but I'm trying to get kind of a spiritual direction here. Entertainment, Entertainment, what do you mean? People want entertainment in here. And you got to try to defend that, right? Somebody give me another thing. Congregational Congregational support, institutionalism, liberalism. You're fighting against that too, right? Tell me another thing. Come on, I know there's more than just two problems. Attendance? There's another one. Uh, There, we'll just stay at three. (laughs) But I guarantee you there's more than three. But you think about there's three situations that you have to have a scriptural stance on, right? And not only have a scriptural stance on, but you want to try to defend that gospel without shoving somebody out the door with it. And you want to draw them closer to God. You don't want to push them farther away on those issues. You want to show them the right way. You want to encourage and edify them the right way. And brethren, that is not as easy as it seems. And that's where striving lawfully comes into play. Because the individual that is good at it, he's been working at it. She's been working at it. It's like an old saying there about that lady that comes and tells that seasoned preacher, she said, I'd give up half my life to know what you know. And his response was, yep, that's about right. (laughs) And it's because he didn't take five years to preach it and then golf the rest of the time. He has to work at these things. It's not only just knowing the word, but it's doing the word. And it's also letting people know about Christ. 
and about God and letting them know that these things that they're learning is not some false doctrine, but it's about God. And brethren, that's not easy because you're trying to balance the will of God and you're also trying to balance the favor in man. And yes, that is important because how are we going to draw in individuals to us if we don't put in something about the favor with man? Once again, I didn't say you didn't have to put God in there. I'm saying in favor of man because Christ did it, the Apostle Paul did it, and if those two could do it, we could do it too. Once again, it's not as easy as it seems. But we can't be lazy about this. We can't sit in our pews. We can't sit in our chairs and we say, let the elders do this. Let the deacons do this. Let the guys who are always here at church, let them do this. Let someone else take care of the things that I need to do. That is laziness. And if we're not willing to work on these things, don't be surprised when the church shuts its doors. This morning... I talked about Franklin Farms. And I, I, we went to a game with, with Nathan, and I said, do you remember, Tracy, you remember going down this road to Franklin Farms? I was pretty clever, I thought, <laughs> because I always, did, I always went there to preach when pirates were playing a home game. <laughs> That's where I spent my afternoons. But that place is shut down now. And I'll tell you why I think it's shut down. Because you had one guy doing everything. And you had this one guy doing everything. And when that one guy was not able to do it anymore, nobody knew what to do to step up. And their solution was not to try to step up and try to do the things he did. No, the solution was, let's shut the doors down. Let's shut it down. Let's close the doors. Brethren, how is that promoting the gospel? How is that building one another up? Building one another up and, and, and trying to encourage one another and trying to, uh, to give glory to God in his church. If we are not doing those things, we are spiritually lazy. And brethren, that is a sin. Don't be lazy. If we're not willing to do these things, we're just doing lip service. Also, too. Let's be careful when it comes to covetousness. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 13 and 14, we, talk, we see about the wicked sons of Eli. And the things about Eli's sons is, here is, evangel, here is priests, we'll talk about evangelism here in a second. Here is priests that are consecrated by God to do godly things, to do godly sacrifices, but they're not doing them according to the will of God. Here they are just focused on themselves. And when it comes to the sacrifice that was supposed to be made for God and they were supposed to have a portion of it, they didn't wait to have God have his portion of it. They decided to take their fork in there and get it for themselves while it was still cooking. And not only doing these kind of things, but being horrible to the people, doing adulterous things with the women, doing all kinds of things that was immoral. And the thing is, is they're so stuck on themselves that they don't realize that they're violating the principles that God told them, I assigned you to do this. Think about how our ministry is today. How... We've really focused on the physical prosperity. It's everywhere. If you follow God, you'll be rich. If you follow, and, and I'm not talking about spiritually rich. I'm talking about physically rich. Materialism, which is a sin. And we, and we see individuals promote that. And we see people overvalue finances. We even got some congregations now that will give you financial help. That was never the church's business. Or they glorify the importance of great possessions. We talk constantly about what great things God has given us, but we never ask what we need to give in return. 
That's where we see these worthless men as described here in 2 Samuel. These are worthless men that we see today where they talk about all this prosperity that we should have and never focus on humility or focus on uh, doing righteousness and hunger and thirsting for righteousness. We don't talk about calling upon the name of the Lord. We don't ask our God, what does he want from me? We ask what God should give us. Yes, our Lord will give us, if we seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, these things shall be added unto us. But if you approach that with a physical prosperity mentality, you're going to be disappointed. But if you're wanting to try to have a peace of mind, and you want to seek that kingdom that he tells us about, where there's no pain and no suffering and no tears, if you long for that, you'll find it. And it's not that hard to find. So, let's strive not to be focused on the physical prosperities of this world. Let's focus on God. Also, too, let's strive lawfully against adultery. And, and not just adultery, but everything that we see here in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Because he tells us this kind of rhetorical question, just like the Apostle Paul is. He says, do you not know that the righteousness will not inherit the kingdom of God? Imagine, if you will, if we just start off with that, that sentence, that question, that statement. And we say to ourselves that if we're not going to do these things, we're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then we go through this list. The sexual immoral, idolaters, adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, thieves, greedy, drunkards, revelers, swindlers will not inherit the kingdom of God. And some people remind us, it says, once we take that step, we can never go back to being righteous. Really? Sometimes we do that ourselves. We beat ourselves down. If somebody has been a thief, we think that they're always a thief. Or if they're a drunkard, they're always a drunkard. Or if they practice sexual immorality, they always will practice sexual immorality. That is wrong. And you got to get out of the mentality of somebody is trying to get out of that hole. Unfortunately, brethren, I've been a thief. Unfortunately, brother, I've been a drunkard. Unfortunately, brethren, I have done sexually immoral things. And thank God, I'm not there anymore. Nobody does like talking about that. Nobody does like talking about confessing your faults to one another. That's scriptural. But brethren, I don't steal anymore. And I don't drink anymore. And I don't do this, the immoral practices anymore either. Remember what the Apostle Paul says. He says, there's a time where we no longer become children, we become men. And we stop doing these childish things. It's the same way with sin. We must understand that we no longer do these things. We don't need to be in the rut of those things anymore. No, we are better now. We are more than just ordinary people. We are the children of God. And by his grace, I have been forgiven. And you could be forgiven. And you could receive that grace as well. Imagine if you would, if, if somebody came up here tonight and says, I want to be baptized in Christ. Do you really think I'm going to tell them, no, no, no. <laughs> I know what you have done wrong. That's not the game we play here. Our game is about saving souls. Our game is about trying to bring people closer to God. Strive lawfully against these things. There will be people that will beat you down. There will be people that will remind you of the past that you have had, and that doesn't matter. If you've taken the right steps, if you've taken the right path, that stuff in the past doesn't matter. Strive to be lawfully for God. You know, this past week, I saw this commercial for Brooks Running Shoes. And of all the guys that had to do it, it was Jeremy Renner. And if you don't know what happened to Jeremy Renner, he was, he was Hawkeye in the Marvels. But 
But the thing with Jeremy Renner is about 15 months ago, and he says this, he goes, I would be the last person to ever advertise for you to buy running shoe. And it's because 15 months ago, he got lambasted by a snowplow. And it almost killed him. And to top it off, saving his life wasn't one thing. He didn't know if he's ever going to walk again for another. But here he is, 15 months later, running up his, running up his driveway at his house. Broken men can be healed. Broken women can be healed. Broken people can come back to God. Don't think that your time is no longer here. Don't think that you don't have this opportunity to come back to God. Yes, you do. You most certainly do. Think about how we need to strive against unrighteousness as well. Once again, it's a, it's a rhetorical question. It says, what agreement has a temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will make my joy among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will come to you. He's asking us, why in the world would Christ have anything to do with the devil? Think about this. Here's a group of individuals that did not believe that the Lord Jesus Christ would save them. Now let me ask you this. If I was in a scenario where I was dying of cancer or some dreaded disease that my life, my lifespan would not be good, I seriously have no doubt in my mind But before I leave here, that someone would tell me, hey, have you ever tried this doctor? Hey, have you ever tried this hospital? Hey, have you ever tried this, this prognosis? Have you tried this, Jay? Have you tried that, Jay? We want you to live. And we will do whatever it takes for you to live. But think about how here is someone that is able to save them spiritually. Would you take it in the exact same fashion? Here's a group that did not seek the kingdom of God or his righteousness. Right now, we're trying to find Peyton a place to live. Right now, as we're worried about a tornado coming through here, we're asking ourselves, where are we going to stay at if we can't get home? I, once again, have no doubt in my mind that my wife and I will try to find the best place for Peyton to live. And I have no doubt in my mind that the brethren here will do whatever they can to make sure that tonight you'll be safe. Tonight you'll be protected. Tonight you'll be okay. Now, ask yourself, are you telling people about the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Here's a group too that is not hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I seriously have no doubt in my mind that I wouldn't leave here if I was hungry, and obviously I'm not. <laughs> and if I was thirsty, somebody would take care of me. I have no doubt in my mind. And it's not, I'm not trying to be arrogant. It's just I, that's how much confidence I have in my own brethren, which I should have, and you should have. But if I needed something, you would make sure I'd be okay. That's fantastic, and I'm forever grateful. But now ask yourself, when is that individual that is not hungry and thirsty for righteousness, what would you do? And think about this. What if someone has been offered all those things, and they said, no thanks? How would you respond? There's a guy down home that stands outside the Walmart parking lot in, in Marietta. And he's always got that sign, need money, thanks, God bless. One of my friends one time decided that she was going to go over to Dairy Queen and give him one of those box meals. 
And she went over there and tried to give it to him, and he was a jerk to her. Do you think she's going to get back? I don't blame her. But that's just the way when it comes to these individuals that don't want to do anything with God. Why do you want to be a part of that? Why do you want to be a part of anyone that you know uh, you're secure about your faith, you're secure about God, you're secure about Christ, you're secure about His Word, and that friend, that individual that you want to hang out with has no interest whatsoever in that. And it's not going, that individual's not going to bring you any closer together. No, it's going to push you further and further away. And that's why Paul's asking this. Why do you want to be a part of that? Because it's not helping you. Strive lawfully against this. Brethren, we're getting it at every corner when it comes to worldliness. We're getting it at every corner when it comes to immorality. We're getting it at every corner when it comes to trying to bend and twist the scriptures. We're getting it everywhere. And if you tell them that's okay... Does that kind of just say, well, they're going to win anyways. What can you do? But no, we selfishly insist that this is not needed in relationship. We do it in marriage. We do it with our friends. We do it with our coworkers. And we say, because if my selfish physical needs are satisfied, all that other stuff is okay. No, brethren, it's not. It just makes things worse. Finally, strive lawfully against dishonoring God. First Samuel chapter two, verse twenty-seven and twenty-eight. Eli is getting a reckoning from God. It's very disturbing because here we see. Samuel, under Eli's guidance, is growing stronger and stronger in this chapter. But when it comes to his sons, his children, his own children, it's a whole different ball game. And they're getting worse and worse. And God is asking Eli, he says, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose them out of the tribes of Israel to be my priests and to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give them unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by father of the, or by fire of the children of Israel? Your children, who I appointed to be these priests, to watch over my people, they have been given a lot of great things. And what did they show in return? he tells them, Eli, things are going to get very bad for you, not only for you and for your children, but also the Ark of the Covenant. Because here you had this great individual growing up in the eyes of the Lord. But for some reason, for one reason or another, we can speculate all day long why Eli's been like this with his kids. But his kids are bad. Yesterday, I went to a graduation party. This, this is my last story, and lesson's yours. I went to this graduation party yesterday, and I, I don't know. If